We're back with more linear programming. This is part two of section 2.7. Again, the I can statement is I can solve problems using linear programming. We got some good experience with the first part where we were just graphing those, um, those limiting factors, those constraints, uh, those restrictions uh, in the form of inequalities, and then coming up with a uh, feasible region where we could check and see which one uh, optimized the function, got a maximum value or a minimum value or different things like that. Now it turns out that the hardest part of most linear programming problems is not graphing and finding that optimal solution, the maximum value or the minimum value. It's actually writing the inequalities from the context of a real world situation. So what we're going to do is we're going to give that a shot on this one. Uh, there, th same problem followed throughout here. And then we may do a couple problems and look at some aspects of a few problems from the assignment today. So here's the example that we're going to be following on this page. A clothing store manager wants to restock with new t-shirts. The store sells Vans shirts for $20 and Ruka t-shirts for $30. The manager needs to stock at least $600 worth of shirts to be competitive with other stores, but the store can't handle more than $1,200 worth of shirts. How many of each shirt should they buy? No, there is no cost or profit function for this first part here. We're not going to be optimizing anything. All we're going to do at the beginning of this is we're just going to practice writing the inequalities. And the first thing we need to do is we need to declare which variable, variable is going to represent which shirt. So we could use V for Vans and R for Ruka. The problem with that is most of us are used to graphing with X's and Y's, and it's just a little bit easier to do that if we just change to X and Y's for, to, from the beginning. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say X is equal to, and this is just a good general rule of thumb, whichever one is mentioned first, let's have that be the X. So we're, uh, Vans is mentioned first, so we're going to say X is the number of Vans shirts. So we're going to say Vans here. And y, uh, Ruka is mentioned second, so uh, Y is going to represent Ruka, okay? All right, the next thing we're going to do is we're, we're going to write two inequalities that show that the number of either one of the shirts can't be negative. They have to be zero or bigger. Well, that means that they're going to be, our, our region is automatically uh, confined to the first quadrant because all of those answers are positive. And if you were paying attention before and caught this in most of them, what that means is X has to be greater than or equal to zero and Y has to be greater than or equal to zero. It is possible that we could have zero Vans shirts or zero Ruka shirts, but it's definitely not possible that they, we'd have a negative number of shirts. That just doesn't happen. Okay, so on the next one, we're going to write two inequalities showing the lowest dollar amount uh, the shirts are worth and the largest dollar amount that the shirts are worth. So if we put these shirts together, well, let's see here. Each one of these shirts, each one of these van shirts is worth $20, and each one of these Ruka shirts, they're worth $30. And we've got these constraints right here that it's got to stock at least $600 worth of shirts to be competitive, but they really can't handle more than $1,200 worth of shirts. So we've got to figure out some sort of inequality, some sort of equation that represents how much those shirts are worth, what's the lowest dollar amount and what's the largest dollar amount. Well, here's how we do that. This X is the number of Vans shirts. They're worth $20 a piece. So we're going to do 20 times X, that would be the amount of money that the Vans t-shirts are worth, and then we're going to do plus 30Y, that's going to be the number of, or the amount of, of money that the Ruka t-shirts are worth, and on the low side, that has to be greater than or equal to 600. They've got to be competitive, so they've got to have more than $600 worth of these shirts. So when you add this dollar amount of these two shirts together, it's got to be more than or equal to $600. And then by the same token, we can't stock more than $1,200, so we're going to do the same thing here. This is going to be 20 times X is the amount that the Vans t-shirts are worth. 30 times Y is going to be the amount that the uh, Ruka t-shirts are worth, and that's got to be less than or equal to 1,200, okay? So we're kind of confined to having a positive number of shirts, or zero at the very least. We can't have more than a total dollar amount of shirts of uh, $1,200, and we've got to have at least $600 to be competitive. So that right there is usually the hardest part of the entire thing. Once we get those inequalities, then we're going to graph it. So I'm going to slide down here. And we're going to take those and it says rewrite the equations in slope intercept form. Well, this one right here, it's a vertical line, so we can't really graph it in slope intercept form, but let's go ahead and write this. We're going to write x is greater than or equal to zero, 
we're going to write y is greater than or equal to 0. And you'll notice that on this, we've already got this confined to quadrant 1, very, very typical constraint. So we're, we're going to just kind of pretend like we graphed this one right here as a vertical line, and then we're shading over here. And then um, we've got y is greater than or equal to 0, so that would be the, the x-axis, and then we're shading above here. So these two together, again, they just mean the answer's got to be in quadrant 1. Now, we want to write these in slope-intercept form so we can graph them. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to move the 20 to the other side. So this is going to be 30y greater than or equal to negative 20x now plus 600. And then we're going to go through and we're going to divide by 30. So if we divide by 30, um, let's see what we end up with. And if we have to grab a calculator, we will. This is going to give us y on this side, still a greater than or equal to. Um, we're going to cancel off the 0, so this is going to be negative 2 thirds x, and then this is going to be plus, let's see, I could cancel those off, 60 divided by 3, that's going to be a 20. Again, if you want to grab a calculator and verify those, that's totally okay. So we've got this one right here, we've taken care of uh, the, the x uh, and the y, and now we've got this first one, now we're, gonna, we're, now we're on this last one. So again, we're going to move that over, we're going to move that uh, 20x to the other side by subtracting 20x, so that's going to give me 30y, subtracting doesn't change the direction of the inequality. Um, and then we get plus 1,200 here. We're going to divide everything by 30 again. And we're going to have a y is, in this case, it's going to be less than or equal to because we've got to be less than that dollar amount. Those are going to cancel to be a negative 2 thirds again. And then this is going to be plus, let's see, I could cancel those off, uh, 120 divided by 3. Go ahead and double check me on your calculator if you'd like to. 1,200 divided by 30 is going to be 40. So now we've got them all in a graph-friendly format. And again, like we said a second ago, these just mean we're working in quadrant one, which we already have the graph set up here. Now, we do want to make sure that we label and scale this. So remember, we set up here that x is Vans and y is Ruka shirts. So we're going we're gonna to write down Vans, and we're going to write down Ruka. And then we need to scale this. So for that, we want to stop and think about, well, this one crosses at 20 and has a slope of negative 2 thirds. So let's say um, we made each one of these worth 10. It's going to go down like this. Um, and this one's going to cross at 40. So if each one of these were, well, we can fit better than that. So we want to make the graph, generally speaking, as large as we possibly can so we can kind of tell what's going on. If each one of these was worth 10, we actually, the biggest one, and this is going to go down from left to right, would be right there. So let's make it a little bit bigger. I think if we counted by fives, I think we'd be in good shape. So this would be five and 10 here, 15 and 20, 30 and 40 and 50. We'll do one more for good measure. And then over here, we're going to have 10, 20, 30, 40. It is usually a, a kind of a best practice, a good idea to scale them both the same. There are times where you can't do that and it wouldn't make sense, but if you can make them both on the same scale, then that would be a good idea. So each one of these tick marks counts for five, and I just labeled every, every other one as 10 or a multiple of 10 to, to just make things a little bit easier. So it says graph all the inequalities and find where the shaded regions overlap. Don't forget to scale and label the axes. Well, good, we were ahead of the game there. So we already know that these first two confine us, confine us to quadrant one, so we're in good shape. Let's go ahead and graph this one right here. This one's gonna cross at 20 and it's going to have a slope of negative 2 over 3. And this is why we want to scale them both the same, because that means that each one of these boxes and tick marks this way counts exactly the same as it, as it does in the, in the other direction. So we can go down 2 and over 3, rise negative 2 and run 3, rise negative 2 and run 3, and we get right there. Now, if we were to do a solid line on this one, we know we're in quadrant one. There's no harm in actually drawing that whole thing. We may have to erase part of it later. You never know. Um, and then on this one right here, um, we're going to cross at 40. And it has the exact same slope. It's a slope of negative 2 over 3. So we're going to go down 2 and over 3, down 2 and over 3 down 2 and over 3, and down 2 and over 3. So this one we actually don't have marked, but that's 60. And then this is a solid line right here. Now it just so happens that these don't intersect. That doesn't happen all the time. But we're in quadrant 1, and we've got to have everything that's bigger than this small little line right here. So it's got to be above there. 
but at the same time, it's got to be less than this line right here. So what that's going to do is that's going to basically define our feasible region as this thing right here. Everything in here, that is our feasible region. Now, we don't often get a, a nice shape like this, but here are the vertices. I'm going to go ahead and put each one of these in here, and then we'll, we'll figure out what they are. This one, of course, we don't go right or left. We just go up 20, so this one's going to be 0, 20. This one, we don't go right or left. We just go up 40. This one, we go to the right, 30, but we don't go up, so that's going to be 30, 0. And then this one right here... Um, is going to be 60 comma 0. All right, so we graphed everything. We found where they overlap. We've got our corners and everything. It says name one combination of shirts that satisfies the constraints. Now, there are a lot of different answers for this. Any point inside this feasible region would actually work. And remember, all of these had the equal to, so all, none of these are dotted lines. They're all solid lines, um, which, again, is very typical in linear programming problems. So I'm just going to pick one almost right in the middle. I'm going to pick this one right there. Now that point right there would correspond to 20 comma 15. So 20 comma 15. And, and what does that mean? Just for the heck of it, let's go ahead and write down what that means. That means 20 Vans t-shirts and it means 15 Ruka t-shirts. Okay? All right, it says what combination would give them the most shirts in the store? Most shirts in the store. Well, the interesting thing about this problem, and this is designed to be kind of a nice little introductory problem here, um, is that um, this is zero uh, Vans t-shirts and 20 Ruka shirts. So really all we have to do is just add the coordinates together. So this is 20 shirts right here, 40 shirts right here, 60 shirts right here, and 30 shirts right here. So what combination would give them the most store, uh, shirts in the store? Well, this one right here. If they did, and again, X, the X axis is the Vans axis. So 60 Vans shirts. So 60 comma 0, that's the combination that would give them the most. That's 60 Vans shirts. Okay? And the least number of shirts would happen over here. So if we did this one, this one would be 0, 20, and that would be 20 Ruka shirts. Okay? All right. Now, hopefully um, this part wasn't too bad. Um, this does take some practice in figuring out what are the constraints, what are the limiting factors on the problem, how do I write down an equation based on that information or an inequality based on that information. And then the graphing I'm hoping is not too bad in identifying the vertices, stating what they mean, where, you know, what are some points in this feasible region, and that sort of thing. Now, this is where the manager really starts to earn her money because she stops and thinks about this and says, well, just because stocking blank t-shirts gives us the most t-shirts, well, just because doing Vans t-shirts, if we stock the entire store, we could have 60 t-shirts in the store. That seems like that might be the best way to make the most money, but maybe it's not. So let's say, um, so just because stocking all Vans t-shirts gives them the most shirts, maybe that's not the, not, not the best way to make the most money. So she knows this. So here's where we get into the optimizing function or the optimal function here. So they make $5 on each Vans shirt, but they make $11 on each Ruka shirt. So she decides to use a profit function. Okay, and this is, again, uh, if we've got a brain that can figure this stuff out, this is where we can get paid some good, uh, good dough. So it says write a profit function for how much the st store would make selling X Vans and Y Ruka t-shirts. No, the profit functions are usually written in this format. So P for profit, X and Y, those are the numbers that we're going to plug in. A times X plus B times Y. Now, you may have seen something like that before. I'm hoping you have. Um, so where A and B are the profit for each one of the items. So if we made $5 on each van shirt and X represents the vans, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do five times the number of vans. And if uh, $11 for each Ruka shirt and um, Y represents Vans, we're going to take 11 and we're going to multiply it by Y. So that's the 11 times the Ruka shirts, 5 times the Y shirts, or the Vans shirts. So we get, whoops, let me make that look nice. Fix that. X comma Y uh, is equal to 5X plus 11Y. So again, this is a profit function. This is what we want to optimize. We want, to, want them to make the most money possible. So 5 times the number of Vans shirts that they've got, 11 times the number of Ruka shirts that they've got. 
And it says, what combination of Vans and Ruka shirts will give them the most profit? And then we, of course, want to remember that vertex principle. So we come back up here and we take a look at this and say, well, um, those are the different combinations for the vertices, 0, 20, 0, 40, and so forth. So I'm going to shrink this down just a little bit so that we can see all of this at the same time. And we're going to write this. We're going to write down this profit function with each one of those points plugged in. So we're going to do 0, 20, um, which would be um, 5 times 0 plus 11 times 20. Then the next one is going to be, let's see, we did 0, 20. We're going to do 0, 40. So this is going to be 5 times 0 and 11 times 40. And then doing these other guys right here. So this is going to be, hit this one right here, 60, 60 vans and 0 rukas is going to be 5 times 60 plus 11 times 0. And then this one, the very last point, is going to be 30 comma 0. And then 5 times 30 plus 11 times 0 because we didn't sell any Ruka t-shirts in either one of those situations right there. So take a look at that for just a second. And then I'm going to slide down and enlarge this just a little bit. What we've done here is we've said, look, this is the number of vans. This is the number of Rukas. So it's $5 for each one of the vans, $11 for each one of the Rukas. $5 for each one of the vans, 11, whoops, need to change that, put a plus there, uh, $11 for each one of the Rukas, $5 for the 60 vans, $11 for none of the Rukas, $5 for each one of the vans, $11 for none of the Rukas there. Okay, so I'm going to slide down here, and this is a fairly simple situation, and I'm hoping that you followed stuff so far. If you need to go back and take a look at something, um, please do. Um, this one right here, here's how this is going to work out. That's going to be zero because five times zero is going to be zero. We didn't sell any Vans shirts. So if we do 11 times 20, that's going to be 220. So that's $220 that way. So if they stocked zero Vans and 20 Rukas, they can expect to make about $220. Well, take a look at this. If they sell more of those Ruka t-shirts, they're going to make more money. And watch what happens here. We do make no money on the vans. 11 times 40 is going to be, well, let's double that amount of money right there. So it's $440. So that's automatically better. We can eliminate that answer right there. And then on this one, we're going to do 5 times 60. Had 60 shirts here, but they only made $5 on each one of them. 5 times 6 is 30, so this is going to be $300 here. Again, feel free to check me on your calculator. And then 5 times 30, that's going to be 150 Again, no surprise, we doubled the number of shirts here. We made twice as much money. Or thinking of it this way, we cut the number of Vans shirts in half. We're going to make half the amount of money. So it says, what combination of Vans and Ruka shirts would give them the most profit? Well, that's going to be this one right here. So I'm going to go ahead and go with another color. $440, zero Vans, and, uh, excuse me, 40, get rid of that, 40 Rukas. All right, again, this was a relatively simple region to deal with, a relatively simple uh, profit function. Uh, hoping you're in good shape, go ahead and do the self-assessment, and then we're going to take a look at a couple of the problems or a few aspects of the problems from the practice assignment. Okay, I've got the practice assignment up here, 2.7b on linear programming, and you'll notice that we've got problem A. It describes a situation right here and then actually gives you uh, the inequalities that come from that situation. So whatever the limiting factors were in here, they actually give those to you. And then down below, what we've got is a graph. Notice that it's uh, uh, scaled, not labeled. Um, and then gives you some more information and then asks you to figure out a maximum profit. It's got some stuff about the type of frame, so we'll read that in just a second. And then another problem on the next page and then several parts here. So each one of these problems kind of works you through the process of solving a problem using linear programming and gives you a certain amount so that we can kind of step up the difficulty as we go along. So um, it says solve the linear programming, programming problems. Be sure to show all work and steps. Um, so here's the deal in problem A. A backpack manufacturer produces an internal frame pack and an external frame pack. Uh, let X represent the number of internal frame frames packs produced in one hour and Y represent the number of external frame packs produced in one hour. 
there are various constraints in the manu manufacturing process, such as sewing, welding, assembling, and so forth. And it, it turns into these inequalities right here. So these are the constraints. Now, the thing that you want to catch in here, if they tell you what these are, they've actually declared variables for you. So x is the number of internal frames. Notice that it came first. And y is the number of external frames, OK? So as we come down here and we take a look at this, and again, they've done us a big favor here by actually um, having this uh, scaled for us. It's not labeled again, but it is scaled for us. So we're going to go ahead and over here, we're going to call this, this again was internal. And these are external frames, external, OK? And we're going to go ahead and graph this. Now, you'll notice that we have those common constraints. Um, let me get this to slide around here. There we go. Actually, I'm going to shrink this down a little bit so we can see the whole thing. All right. So you'll notice that we have these common constraints here that basically limit us to quadrant one. So those guys right here, we know we're in, we're in quadrant one. Let's go ahead and solve these. So I'm going to move the x to the other side. We're going to have 3y is less than or equal to. And that's going to be a negative x plus an 18. We're going to divide both sides by 3. That's going to give us y is less than or equal to. Again, we're dividing by a positive. So that doesn't change the direction of the inequality. Um, we've got a negative 1 third for the slope on this one once we uh, uh, simplify that. And then 18 divided by 3 is going to be a 6. So we're going to be graphing this one right here. And then I'm going to change colors to do the other one. If you move this to the other side, well, holy cow, take a look at that. If you move that to the other side by subtracting, the y is all by itself. So we're going to have y is less than or equal to um, negative 2x plus 16. OK? Now, again, this is scaled for us. So what we'd do next is we'd go through and we'd graph this. So I am going to uh, work through and graph uh, both of these. So this is going to cross at 6. So that's going to be right here. And it's going to have a slope of negative 1 third. And again, notice that they're both scaled the same. So we should be able to just go down 1 and over 3, down 1 and over 3. We're going to follow that stair step pattern all the way to the end. And notice that it crosses at 18. And the answer's got to be less than that. So we know we're going to be on the bottom part of that. So I'm not going to draw the entire thing yet because I don't want to make a mess of this. Um, and then over here, we've got y is less than or equal to negative 2x plus 16. So we're going to start up here at 16. And the slope is, slope is negative 2, so negative 2 over 1. So that means we're going to start at 16, and we're going to go down 2 and over 1, down 2 and over 1. So we're going to again follow this stair-step pattern here. Notice that they intersect right there. That's going to be pretty nice. And this is also a less than. So we've got to be smaller below the blue line and below the red line. Well, if you stop and think about what that means, that means we're in quadrant one. So we're above the horizontal axis, above the vertical axis. So we're in here, basically. And we've got to be less than the blue line and less than the red line, so below there. So this is our feasible region right here. So I'm going to go ahead and put a dot right here, right here, and right here. And I'm going to kind of. Draw some lines in here, square that in or shade that in. Um, if you wanted to leave these lines and these dots, there's really no problem with doing that. I am going to clean this up just a little bit so that it looks like that. Um, and then we can identify what each one of those vertices are. For example, this is 0, 0 and 8, 0. And this one would be, let's see, I erased this or covered up the 6 there, so that would be 0, 6. OK. And then down below, You'll notice that it's got some other information. Here's what it says. So here's the part that we need to figure out. It says, the manufacturer knows they make $50 for each internal frame pack and $80 for each external frame pack. They've also developed a profit function. So they've given you the profit function. And then what they want us to do is determine the maximum profit for manufacturing both backpacks for those given constraints. Um, and then use that information to find this right here. So what is the maximum profit? And tell them how many internal frames they should make each hour and how many external frames each they should make each hour. Now, I'm going to leave the rest for you to figure out. This is a, these are really good exploratory problems. We're going to take a look at this next one. And I'm just going to point out, read this and notice what they've done for you. They've given you each one of the inequalities based on the constraints, and they ask you to explain what each one of those are. So I just want to point out here, this has a 16 in it, 
If you look right here, there's a 16 in the instructions, and it says they plan to run at most 16 ads. Well, we haven't read the entire thing, but if you read the rest of that, that probably is a good hint as to why that's right there. There's a 2,000 in here. I see a 2,000 right there and so forth. You see these other numbers right there, the 50 and the 200? Slide down here. Let's take a look at that. Um, oh, there we go. There's the 50 and the 200. Um, and then they've got some other information, a 5 and a 14, and we can see that down here. Now, I am going to take a look at this one right here. Uh, the last one I'm going to leave for you, but it says the owner of a 600 square meter parking lot is getting ready for some customers who will park to go to a big football game. She knows car requires six square meters and a bus requires 30 square meters of space. The lot can handle a maximum of 600 vehicles. It says fi uh, fill in the inequalities and explain what each one of them means. Hint X is cars, Y is buses. So they mentioned cars first, that's why it's X. They mentioned buses second, that's why it's Y. You'll notice that we've got X is greater than or equal to zero. So we don't have anything to fill in, but we do have something to explain there. There is a missing one right here, if you stop and think about that. Uh, you can probably figure that out because these have come up on every single one of these. Um, we've got a 6x, we've got nothing in front of the y, and we've got 600. You'll notice the 600 represents square meters. And then we've got a plain old x and a plain old y, and there is another number in here that has not been used at all. So um, go through and read those, and then you'll notice that when you get done with those, on each one of these, you've got a graph that you'll need to do. Um, you, you'll need to scale and label the axes and that sort of thing. So this, is, this steps up in difficulty. This first one, not too bad, helped you a whole bunch with that. They gave you basically everything there. And then they gradually get more difficult as you go along. But by the time you get done with this, you should be in good shape.